Hello and thank you for coming back to another episode of the Magnetic Entrepreneur Podcast. My name is Della. Here we explore superheroes, individuals who through living their passions are impacting the world on a daily basis, uplifting others, making positive changes to the world around them. One of these superheroes is Terence Kosakar. It is my absolute pleasure to invite him on this podcast today so that we can get to know him just a little bit better. Uh, Terence is a psychophysiologist. Uh, he is the founder of a unique organization called Camp My Way, which is an all natural adventure based um, camp program which is designed for um, first responders, alcoholics, addicts, and youth at risk, and individuals who are suffering from PTS injuries. Um, Terence uh, is a former fireman turned advocate for mental health and social justice. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Terence Joseph. Kosakar on the podcast today. Hi, Terrence. Bella, I I listened to the intro and I'm like, who's this guy you're talking about? Like, wow. What I an mean, amazing guy he must be. No, no. Uh, well, you the superhero part of that, but I consider myself, I'm just a farmer, just just planting seeds with the people. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. It's an honor to get to see your beautiful smile today. And uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I don't get nervous, but you got me all like, I've got some big shoes to fill now, buddy. Like, like you know, I'm just a guy. <laughs> that's, that's, that's just me. Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, what, what an amazing intro. I've got to use that on some of our videos. because I'm like, you, you got you my must. heart rate up. Nice. You know what? Yeah. You yes. are a superhero. You know, you know why? Because you have superpowers. And to me, a superpower is the light you shine on this world. And you light up a big, big area, my friend. And I want to get to know all about that today. Well, I, I, thank you. I, I'm really grateful. Uh, but, but I have to actually step back for a second and, uh, and, and say two things. You know, um, when we put um, first responders or people on a pedestal like that, um, we have, we feel like we have this, uh, we, we, at the end of the day, we're human. And in order to do the work that we do do today, uh, in the last five years, uh, and shine light that only stems from 40 years of dancing in the deepest, darkest depths of the devil's belly, let me tell you. Mm -hmm. So it's an honor to be, a, I'm grateful to be alive today and uh, to have this conversation with you. Well, that's, that's exactly it. Because you lived that life experience, that what, that's what puts you in this unique position to have these difficult conversations. Uh, and not everybody's capable of that. So You'd be surprised. You'd be, you know, I am nobody special. Every single one of us, every single human has the gift to share. We all have a, an amazing story. It's a matter of do we, do we take a look at and stay in that story and place blame to it? Or what do we learn from that story and our experiences, the lessons from falling on our face over and over and over again to finally stand back up and say, hey, you know what? Wow, hey, I could use this experience, these tools that I've got to get my life back and just share them with other people. And that's all we're doing. I love it. I yeah. love it. Make yeah. that a part of your story and not your whole story. I wish I had my pen. Ah! I love it. Yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll send it to you. <laughs> so, so, so Terrence, sounds great. what is yes. that story? <laughs> uh, buddy, where do you want to start? 
<laughs> let me you like to start. Let me let me ask you. Well, uh, you know, I I grew up. Um, I'm familiar. We're talking about mental health. You know, uh, we're talking about post traumatic stress, depression, substance abuse. So, you know, in order to have a good idea of um, some of the experience that I've had in life, um, we'll go all the way back to childhood and we'll kind of blast right through it. But uh, when I was five years old, uh, my father um, set the house on fire while we were sleeping. And, um, you know, he was uh, sentenced to Kingston Penitentiary for life. He did about eight years there. And then he was transferred over to a place in Ontario called uh, Penetanguishing, which is an institute for the criminally insane. And I know we were talking earlier a little bit about schizophrenia, and my father was diagnosed manic depressive, schizophrenic, uh, psychotic. Uh, and uh, my childhood growing up, um, I don't remember the fire. But my nervous system and growing up very insecure, uh, you know, kids at school find out, you know, your dad's in the nut house, so you're crazy too. You're like your dad. And so, you know, that stigma and that judgment, um, when we talk about, when I speak sometimes about being bullied, it was, doesn't necessarily mean I was cornered into the corner and kids took my lunch money and beat me up. Just the words. Just, just, just people walk away from you um, is to in my um, experience that that hurts you know when you're growing up in in, in those um, you know you're eight nine ten twelve fifteen years old with no tools or understanding on how to express or manage your emotions and it's a very difficult path and it's very uh, confusing and it leads to very um, dark thoughts and questionable, you know, do I want to live? Where am I going and why? But, uh, and, then, and that's why at 15 years old, I uh, got jumped into my first street gang and uh, spent the next 15 years working in organized crime. Uh, addicted to crystal meth, in and out of jail, prison, all that kind of crap. And, um, you know, it wasn't until, oh, um, 1999, I was uh, sentenced to five years in the Supermax Federal Prison down in Atlanta, Georgia, um, for possession of cocaine and just trying to hustle and make some bucks. Um, and, it, and, and it was at that point I was sitting in my cell. Um, you know, in, a, in Supermax, it's 23 and a half hour a day lockdown. So can you imagine just being in, in your bathroom 23 hours a day? And, and, and the half hour that you do get out of your cell you know, you have 80% uh, of the population is um, uh, of color and you're the white boy. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to express in words um, these um, emotions and the, the psychological torture that comes along with the 23 hours of sitting in your cell questioning your last 15 years of crime, um, you know, I was a prostitute for many years, uh, you know, in and so the amount of lives that you see suffering, struggling, dying, overdosing, um, raped, hustled, bustled, sold, all of it, Decap you name it, things that I don't need to get right into, but uh, you're sitting there with yourself and the visions, the sounds, the smell while you're listening to others grown men losing their minds and their virginity while you're trying to question your insanity. Uh, all the tears that were shed throughout all these last 15 years, it just, it's a, it doesn't stop. And there was one thing, Della, that kept my head on straight and my ass clenched tight. <laughs> and that was, I would look at <laughs> And that, that was looking out of my cell window, out of the uh, razor wire outside my window. And there was this uh, little pigeon that would just sit there like every day. And I would, I would just look at that pigeon and think, when I get out of this hellhole, I'm going to change my life around 150%. And I started imagining being like a police officer. Or like, uh, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. I started imagining having a family. 
maybe being a part of the good guys, like maybe a search and rescue or a firefighter living up in the mountains in British Columbia, Canada. Well, I was deported uh, some after I did some time, and I moved to Whistler, British Columbia, and uh, it took a couple of years to get my first responder tickets, and I became a volunteer ski patroller, started a family, and um, uh, also became a paid-on-call firefighter. And I basically traded all of my... I, I joined the other side of the tracks. I, I had 180 degrees. But what I didn't realize at the time was my fire... Driving a fire truck or rescuing patients, um, the cross on my back, these were... This was just a mask. Every single day, still carrying the weight, the pain, the guilt, the shame... And what made me get through it was, okay, I'm a productive member of society today. Mm -hmm. I have a cross on my back. Nobody can see my darkness. Nobody can see the shit storm that I've left behind me. And I was basically just fooling myself, really. I traded it all, the drugs, the everything, for just a new uniform, a new mask. Covering up still the pain from childhood. I didn't, I didn't walk around going, oh, my dad burnt the house down. And all. But now, all these years later, I'm learning more about post-traumatic stress um, and the emotional impact that depression, anxiety, all these emotions have on us. These are, this is what's right about us. It's not about what's wrong with us. It's learning about the energy that's given off when we're in a dangerous life threat situation however that looks for you the organism the people one human and the energy that's given off but yet not completed that cycle we give off energy to protect us but because that energy remains trapped in our nervous system this is what causes our troubles or challenges wow. and, and we can get into that later i just i know sometimes i got to take a breath and make sure that we're still on the same page here. It's, it's amazing. I never really thought about this, but I can so resonate with this because we carry guilt and shame from our past. And if we don't deal with it properly, it will never be healed. So then we're just taking on new, a new life form, but really we're living a fake, um, we're, we're wearing a mask, like you said, exactly that. Um, and, and it's like, almost like we are trying to overcompensate because I did that. Now I got to do double, triple, you know, quadruple. Oh my gosh. That's so good. So good. Yeah. 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 That's right. So tell me about your experience with that. What do you mean by that? Like you have your personal experience also, like with doubling up and doubling down and putting on that mask and sure sure and i mean you know it's it's stuff from the past right it's it's your stuff like you said it's it's all all the stuff from the past what so so maybe um maybe i was uh you know guilty of of whatever jealousy or you know anger or hatred or you know mm -hmm. Uh, lying or cheating and all these things and you you know the and it, it seems like the more the more sin I, I want to just use that word uh, the yep. more sin we 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 do we, we commit the the thicker of a wall we put around ourselves so that we pe people can't see us and eventually we can't even see any way out or we can't even see the truth or uh, or other people so it's just it's very it's very fascinating but this is your interview terence not mine so keep it <laughs> i'm trying to dela gate yeah. <laughs> not working not working <laughs> not really. well you know uh that being said you know the you know we get into um the days of, you know, where we get into, should say we get into, what's a good example? Um, a lot of us, us, all of us, uh, we're all on the same team. Here. We're all humans on this earth. We, we, we tend to, like I just shared that story with you from childhood, 
to bullying, to gangs and drive-by shootings and prostitution, we'd like to say those were the problems because those are like really shitty things. So people will be like, oh my God, like, of course you're traumatized. But you know something? Even a five-year-old child undergoing a major tooth surgery is equally as traumatizing to that child as it is their father burning the house down. The nervous system doesn't say, father committed crime, tried to burn house. Nervous system doesn't say, little John is just having his tooth pulled, he'll have some ice cream and the tooth fairy will come later. Nervous system perceives this as life-threatening and gives off energy naturally. So if we think about this for a second, as we come into this world, we're, we're only, I call it the boss, the boss, the brain's operating system, is in order for it to run, it's like your car. For example, it needs, it operates at 12 volts. For the instinctual part of the brain, the rational and the emotional parts of the brain, the three pistons are firing, needs 12 volts. We come into this world, and whether you're one years old, three years old, perhaps father is yelling at mother. That negative energy and that frequency, that child's nervous system might perceive this as life-threatening, so gives off energy. Child might see, like, let's for example, like two months ago, everybody's wearing their masks. That's scary to a child. Where's all these grown people walking around with, looking at me trying to talk to them with these shields? That's going to cause the nervous system to give off energy. The same as a soldier being in Afghanistan getting shot at gives off energy. So let's just hypothetically say, just for easy numbers, each one of these events since childhood, the nervous system gives off say, 100 volts to protect you. Well, that 100 volts doesn't just dissipate. It's still trapped. It remains trapped in our nervous system. So by the time we get to 5 years old, 7 years old, 9 years old, 10 years old, most humans by that age living the way we do in society today, this century and previous, we're trying to operate with 1,000 volts trapped in our nervous system. So it's not like we see people walking around humming because somehow since childhood we have found a way to navigate our way through the gauntlet, navigate our way through these emotions. You see, each person Bella, has a, I don't want to say melting point or breaking point, but at some point the car, when you add too much voltage to that battery, the windshield wipers are going to just start going on. The car is going to start talking to you. Well, the good thing, the best thing about the human design is we have the, the biological process that will biologically pro move that energy. So we reach that point where the body says, okay, you're going to start <laughs> doing some really stupid shit here soon, bro. I got, I got to move the energy. So now the biological process starts to move the energy, which is a good thing because it's about to melt down. Now, now what happens is, what happens? The third part of our brain, the emotional part of our brain kicks in. Now we start feeling depressed, anxious, suicidal, stressed out, angry. Or we might just start crying for no reason. But something must be wrong with me. But our medical system isn't sharing with us today, but that's what's right about you. These are the signs that we should be looking out for saying, bing, if I'm crying uncontrollably, if I'm angry for just out of the blue, just start grabbing shit and throwing it. If I start abusing substances, if I, if I can't sleep, these are signs saying that you have too much energy trapped in your nervous system and the biological process is kicking in and trying to move it. So in other words, get your ass up and you do the work to move the energy. Exercise, meditation, breathing, proper nutrition, 
every single day. We have to move that energy. Or else we end up going to the doctor 10 years later after losing our spouse, our family, our job, our dignity, our freedom, our end up in prison going, man, there sure is something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. No, the only thing wrong is that we weren't given the right education, the knowledge, or the tools to manage our emotions, starting at five. Amazing. You're so right. You're so right. You know, the, the Dalai Lama says, if we can teach every child at the age of five how to meditate for one hour a week, we can end all violence and hatred globally within one generation. So hold on a second. <clears throat> oh, okay. So why aren't we doing that? And why aren't we doing that? I don't want to say it out loud, but that's bad for business. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm I just know. being straight up, right? It's crazy, though. Like, they, the system... Um, ends up spending so much more money, right? It, on, the system on, ends up, go ahead. Yeah, and, and I get it, I get it. They also end up making a lot of money. Yes. That's right. I get That's it. Right. That's right. Uh, we, we have to be question. Sorry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sorry. I get, I get a little excited when it comes no, to this I, topic. I get excited because, too. I'm with you on this yeah. because I feel like uh, if we are we are missing a lot of coping skills um, in our school system, our curriculum needs to to be totally revamped. I mean, yes, teach the kids geology and geography and geometry and whatever you want, but at the same time, teach them how to ha handle stress. At the same time, teach them how to be self compassionate. At the same time, teach them how to meditate. Right. I know. Express gratitude, forgive, have open conversations about. So, you know, if we relied on our education system, that, that's not their responsibility. It's ours as parents, as people, as teachers. As um, we, We've come to um, this stage in our evolution where it's our responsibility to be teaching our child at home. When we leave them to go to school to learn the system that who knows who wrote all of those books, well, then guess what? That then, you know, yeah. so it's, to, it's up to parents. Now, I believe you um, understand 100% that we should start to share this in our schools. So this way, in 80 years from now, the kids who are getting the chance to learn today get to experience the benefits and the value of this. And then they have children and they have children and it gets handed down the line. And, and then at which point then you have um, a whole new um, generation of humans um, that are coming into governments, coming into power, coming into making sure that these are mandatory parts of our well-being and our lifestyle. Um, you got a good point, Terrence, because um, we need to take personal responsibility, and I agree with you. We can't point fingers. Uh, it's got to start from us, and one thing I heard is that kids do what the parents do. So, you know, if, if you want your child to start meditating, you have to start meditating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know something that's that's... I have a friend of mine, a good friend I just spoke with yesterday. His name is Sean McNaughton. He's the president of uh, the Canadian Mental Health Association. <laughs> and um, he let me know that he's having a baby. And I was like, wow, that's really cool, Sean. Now, I said, listen, while you're laying with your wife and your child, start your breathing exercises. Start operating at that level of consciousness, that positive energy, and believe it or not, while child's still in womb, they get it. They're getting that positive energy. And when child comes into this world and they're in your arms and you're doing the same breathing techniques, your mindset is at a, operating positively, then by the time child's one, two, three years old, this becomes, this is just what we do. It's that monkey see, monkey do, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. You're so yeah. right.
<laughs> Did I tell you I'm a volunteer with the Canadian Mental Health Association? You didn't. <laughs> uh, when, what uh, what'd you do with them? So, um, while my brother was um, at his worst with his uh, schizophrenia, I tried to get some help. Um, and I ended up at the Canadian Mental Health Association doing the, their program called uh, Family Caregiver Program. It was a fantastic 10-week course, and they taught us how to uh, communicate better, how to understand mental health, how to separate mental health from the person, how to um, support them. Yeah. Back up one second. Yeah. So, can you say that again? You went, so that you walked in to get some support. Yes. I, I, I really went to get support, but what they enrolled me in this 10 week program to teach me about mental health because I okay. was clueless. And so part of yes. the teaching was that um, your loved one who is living with a mental health, um, it's really important to differentiate that this is him and this is his mental health. This is, you know, when he's acting up, when he's angry, when he's yelling, when he's uh, being really mean, it's not him. It's the mental health. So that was a that was a that was a really big thing for me because I always looked at my brother and I thought he's such an asshole. You know, in, without understanding what he was going through. Uh, so what's your take on this? I, I, I feel like you guys take on this. Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, my, <laughs> my, my ass tightened yes. when you said, when you had said, there's him and there's his mental health. <clears throat> well, he's the same. It's no difference. Like I had tried to share earlier is energy from his childhood, the way his nervous system even though you were brought up, excuse me, in the same home, probably you know, ate the same food, had the same parents, obviously, um, <clears throat> doesn't mean you're, both of your nervous systems are going to operate the same. Mm -hmm. you, you, you both have different fingerprints for a reason. We are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So the way his nervous system perceived the tooth being pulled, mom not coming home, somebody punched him in school when he was seven or took his toy out of the sandbox, could have been ex just extremely traumatizing, causing the nervous system to give off energy, good. Now, we're not moving that energy, so now comes, there's no way I can express my emotions. Because you know, in reality, how do you really ex say that I'm pissed off or angry? Punching a wall, is, that's an action. That's not an expression of language. Same with sadness. How does a human say, this is what sad feels like to me? Okay, well, I cry and it feels that, well, those are your words. And we can't really express emotions in language. It's a feeling. Whether they're ang anger, sadness, whatnot. So for him, at a younger age, coming up, there's nothing wrong with him at all. It's what's wrong is he doesn't understand how to express these emotions that are bothering him. And then, of course, everybody's starting to point fingers and starting to say mental health and starting to say this and starting to say that. Take some pills, try this, do a little bit of cocaine, some free porn. I'll go to the casino. Okay, and it's just like you're getting beat down. And now the problem, of course, escalates even more because for this individual, let me ask, let me just make it real simple. Was he this way at five, six, seven, eight, nine years old? No. Always? Right, exactly. So we take a look at his environment. Mm -hmm. People say, oh, there's something wrong mentally with something. I'm going to tell you right now, the only thing wrong is it's environmental, not mental. That's good. If I if I took one of these deer, I got I got six deer that come by here every day. I got a lion. Uh, we got everybody here. In a lion? Did you say yeah. a lion? Well, mountain lion, not like a African lion, but a cougar. Cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I hope they visit you while you were talking. Uh, they don't like to be on Zoom calls. Oh, I, I yeah, they're they uh, and they're they're not even into the Instagram or nothing. They just they get about their business, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, 
And actually, Fozzie Bear and Fuzzy Butt might show up. Those are our two resident bears. They're only oh. two years old, these two, and they're the oh, cutest oh things God. in the world. Yeah, Amazing. they come. They come, and we got a big, you know, a big outdoor gazebo out here, like five couches under there. And we'll come out in the morning for coffee, and like Fozzie Bear will just be sitting on the couch, hold, you know, just kick back. Or, oh, you're kidding! It, it, that's oh awesome. no, I mean, that's awesome. These <laughs> bears are too much. But now, if I was to here. Um, if I was, if if we were to take one of these animals and put it in the city, how do we think that animal is going to respond to its environment? Mm -hmm. Violent, so, yes. Oh, it's well, it's fight, flight, freeze. Yes. It's your tip. It's your natural response. Yes. And more than likely, the deer would just. Uh, you know, freeze like. But see, as the deer is responding, either the fight, flight, freeze, as we are designed with the same brain. That's energy. You see, let's put. It, okay, here. How about it? This for a good example. And I'll try to share this sometimes. High schools and stuff. So, I study these animals. And, and humans, we, you know, we have such a natural uh, ability to heal, same as animals do. And I wonder why are animals traumatized? And what, but why are humans so fucked? Sorry, I just got to, uh, you know. <laughs> we, we are. Look how far we've come. And I only say that, and I shouldn't have cussed. I sometimes need to put my off button on. But when I, when you see how many people are, homeless in the streets we had 151 overdoses just last friday we have you know so to me that's it's unacceptable because these are human beings with a gift of life to enjoy to dream to live to breathe to adventure and i wonder why so we'll put it this way i look at the deer and okay so there's the deer eating the grass. And if I came running out at that deer, what's going to happen? Instinctually, the response. I, fly, fight? No, not fight, but probably flee. He'll probably run away. Yeah, okay. deer, it, yeah. Ap, buddy, let me tell you something. A deer, it will yeah. quickly. Mm -hmm. Now that amount of energy that it takes to ignite that flight, that it's it's like it's a it's like a gun going off. <laughs> Deer's gone. Mm -hmm. That didn't just happen with twelve volts. It happens with a lot of voltage, a lot of energy. That deer takes off. Well, let's say I'm the lion and I'm chasing that deer. <laughs> I'm gonna eat you, I'm gonna eat you, I'm gonna eat you. Energy, 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 energy. Finally, the deer has a backup plan. It reaches, it has too much energy in the nervous system. It's going 50, 60, 80, 90 kilometers an hour too much. It shuts down. Just drops. Overload. System overload. So I, the lion, takes the deer, pull it into the forest, and eat it a little bit later. Hour later, the deer comes to. Gets back up. Have you seen this ever? What happens next? The deer gets back up to its feet. And it just starts shaking. And shaking. And shaking so violently. Ears, tails, arms. That 50, 60, 70 kilometers an hour, that thousands and thousands of volts, that deer is now completing, it's biologically processing that energy, and it sh will shake nonstop until it completes that cycle right back down to 12 volts of energy. And then <laughs> it just goes back to eating again and is not traumatized. Humans don't shake it off anymore. 
you know, they used to call it back in World War II, shell shock. Oh, you know, the man was so scared he was shaking in his boots from the artillery fire. He wasn't scared of nothing. His nervous system was responding the same as the deer to too much energy. And we used to lock those guys up and say he has shell shock. And even a hundred years ago, we'd shoot them or behead them for, for responding naturally. So it's, so did that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. Humans have the same brain. Animals, like the reptile, we have the reptilian brain. Instincts just operates instinctually. Second part of our brain, um, rational. You, you keep talking. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> well, but, but I know there might be one other person watching this, and they might be like, yes. I wanted them to give them a chance to put their thinking cap on and take it in. Just, just do Because I'm, 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 uh, I'm notorious for like... I'll, I'll, I'll just sit here and quietly listen. <laughs> <laughs> well, three parts to the human brain. The boss, the, the brain's operating system. We have one third is the reptile, reptilian brain, which is our animal, in, which is our instincts. That says, I need water. <laughs> I'm going to die. I need food. <laughs> um, there's a grizzly bear behind you, Terrence. Get out of there. <laughs> you know, no, when we seriously. see... seriously. Seriously, no. Yeah, that wouldn't even bother me. It, it would just be Homer. Homer's the grizzly bear. He loves... We, we get along. We're good. We're, we're not playing... We're not jumping through hoops and stuff together. And we're not, like, high-fiving or Instagramming, but <laughs> Homer's, Homer's got his place and I got mine. <laughs> That's and I am on his menu, so I do keep the distance. <laughs> now, the second part of our brain is the rational part of our brain. So, like most anim so that's the animal. So, for example, like if I was to go creaking through the woods and the deer was there, not crashing, but creaking, snapping branches, the deer goes. He stops for a second and rationalizes the situation. The deer rationalizes, says, looks at the sound and says, can I eat it? Can I eat that? Should I run from it? Or can I mate with it? That's all, that's all the animal does. And we have the same. That's the second third of our day. And the third, a third, three is the emotional part of our brain. So it lets us care so much, cry so much. That makes us angry. It's what makes us human. It's a wonderful thing. So it, it baffles me in today's world. We have all these gifts, all this knowledge and education. Is how come our society and our civilization is completely buckling at its seams right now? So. Well, we have the opportunity today to be on the Magnetic Entrepreneur Podcast to plant seeds in people's mind to help maybe shed a little bit of light. And uh, I really thank you for this opportunity to get to do that. That's exactly it, right? That's, that, that's what this is. I think um, the more knowledge people have access to, uh, the, you know, the more powerful they become, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I want to ask you a little bit about what you're doing at uh, Camp uh, My Way. Well, thank you. That's, uh, that's a really good question. People might wonder what the hell is Camp My Way and why? Well, I'll share, I'll share with people why. It's, um, I think I left the story off as I became a firefighter and a family man. Um, and I did that for almost 12 years until the Vancouver 2010 Winter Olympics. Um, I was working as a uh, EMR, emergency medical responder, at the bobsleigh luge track in Wisdom. And um, on opening day, there was a luge athlete by the name of Nodar Kumrat Teshvili from Georgia. Um, he had come down the track at 153 kilometers an hour. 
and he had an accident and he came out of the track and collided with a solid steel post and landed beside me. And I, uh, our, myself and three of our team immediately responded, did what we could do to try to save the man's life and uh, sadly no one didn't make it. And each day uh, went on with the games and uh, now what's happened is a lot of the emotions from my past, from prison, from jet, from all the crap, really the energy. I didn't know this at the time, but the energy had had on you know, that meltdown. Like I'm talking a meltdown. Like I, I'm not using drugs anymore. I, I don't have the tool that I've been using most of my life to manage this sort of meltdown. And let me tell you something, buddy. You got put on that mask, and you have a couple billion people from around the world watching. You have to continue to respond to all of the athletes during the Olympics. Um, that's a really tough gig. Um, long story short, one hour after the Olympics were over, I went to try to die by suicide. That was my first first attempt at suicide after um, an entire life of. Uh, lots of different events and I went to see my doctor a few days later with my family like what the is wrong with you my family like like you play hockey do this you're the kid you're our stepson's basketball coach you're uh, doing all this volunteer work in the you're a fireman you what are you doing trying to kill I said ah, I don't know what the hell I was trying to do I I don't, know. I don't know. And when I went to see the doctor, the doctor says, I think you have PTSD. And I said, <coughs> what? And I cussed. So if you got the beep button, go ahead and play it now. But I said, <laughs> what? The? I said, what the fuck is PTSD? You know, because, you know, I just tried to kill myself. And my doctor is trying to tell me I have something that I've never heard of. So that was the, my response. And he said, you're going to need a psych, see a psychologist, psychologist to get a diagnosis. But in the meantime, these horns came out and the tail grew out. Mm. Take some of these. Mm. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> Take some of these. And take some of these antipsychotics, uh, tenazepam, benz benzos, and oxy. And I'm a crystal meth. I'm a crystal meth crack cocaine guy. I don't know what none of this is. But let me tell you, I got to the pharmacy an hour later, filled my script, taking all this stuff, and whew, buddy, let me tell you something. I'm fine. <laughs> I'm good to go. Yeah. I'm digging this PTSD thing. You know, I shouldn't say Oxycontin. I, Percocets, which is a... Some is in it, only 5%. But I'm feeling pretty good. And let's see. Let's just fast forward five years from that day. I uh, ended up losing all of my positions as a first responder. Um, three treatment centers, three more, three attempted suicides. I lost my family 13 years and ultimately found myself living homeless on the downtown east side just five years ago. Rimaging around the alleyways, robbing heroin dealers again, you know, after, after all these years. <laughs> And, and, and I'm back in the belly of the beast. And my last crime that I committed when I robbed the last heroin dealer, I was convinced in this deep state of, I was in it. You know, have you heard of what psychosis, like what psychosis is? Yes. It's, you know, like, it's where you really feel, you really feel like there's three stages. And I was in the stage three of a psychosis where, like, bugs are 
actually crawling on your bones and consuming you from the inside out. Or you will take things to just try to kill all the bugs. You will... You, you hear the voices. You, 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 you see the faces. Your whole life flashes in front of your eyes like every breath you take. And I went to the Lionsgate Bridge to jump. And... I woke up here. I opened my eyes in my cabin in November. Here. Shivering. About 40, 50 pounds underweight. Face caved in. Bed. Just so dripping. The mattress was pretty much dripping out the bottom. The smell of like a morgue. I swear am I. And I was shivering so bad, which was, now I've learned the energy. The energy. The energy. It wasn't cold. It was the energy. Shaking off the energy. And who knows how long or how many days I've been there. How I even got here. I actually, I actually think I jumped. This is just the next life. To tell you the truth. <laughs> Seriously. Nope. You never found out if someone brought you here. No, I, have, I, I, I do, the universe, and this dimension, we won't get into it. That's a whole nother podcast. That's another, <laughs> that's another talk. That, that's, that, that's, a, that's, a whole nother, um, that's a whole nother talk. But what I did was I needed to, what I thought, go get firewood. And I went into my um, garage got the chainsaw i went over to the highline road just over that mountain right there and i just started i fired up the saw and i started taking down a tree off the road there and the tree came down crash and i'm and, you know keep in mind you know i'd been up for almost a month and a half previous to this doing more substances than it's even humanly possible so this task just to get from here to there was hell. Anyways, the tree comes down. I turn around, and there's a native man, like sitting on his ATV with a thirty odd six rifle on there. He's all on his camos, and I'm like, "Oh shit!" Like, here's the white boy, you know, up here falling trees like they're mine. <laughs> I think I'm getting scalped. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm like, "Oh great." And he says, how's it going? Bah, let me tell you, you know, and I'm looking, I'm a bag of shit. I said, I gave him my story. I, I just came to, I'm just trying to get some firewood. He says, why don't you come to my property and you can have all the wood that you want. And it's a lot more safe than being on the side of this thing. And this is the first man since the doctor gave me my prescription five years previous that didn't want something from me, didn't have me fill out paperwork, hoops, pills, who are you, sorry you don't qualify, we're closed, blah, blah, blah. You need a helping hand? Come to my property and take what you need. Seton Lake Indian Band. His name is Andy Alexander. Saved my life by the old ways. When you have another man, a community who's just giving to you, now you have hope. And I bring some of that wood back over his place. I'm bucking up wood. Two days later, I chopping the wood here and I turn around and there he is again this mystical creature <laughs> I, he, and he just looks at me he's, how's it going <laughs> like you know brother I'll be honest with you I'm starving I'm starving and he says let's go fishing Let's go fishing. Let's go fishing. That's how the First Nations people, that's how the indigenous people do for thousands and thousands of years. You're hungry. Let's go fish. Let's go fish. Yeah. 
let's go hunt. Took me fishing, took me hunting. We got a deer, we got all uh, a couple Dolly Vardens, some salmon, and, and we're getting to camp my way, by the way. It's the, just the foreplay to it all. And so I'm on day five, six now, and I'm eating good. I'm putting in the work to go get my food. I didn't just go to the grocery store. I'm eating organic. I'm with a man who isn't judged me for anything from other than another human being. Not my color, not my uniform, not how much money I have or the car, anything. That's it. That positive energy. So I'm on day six. And I got to go fishing. I'm hungry. So I go down to the river, and sure enough, on my way down to the river, I see this uh, tractor tire. And, and I had a kind of a flashback. Do you know who George St. Pierre is? No. Uh, 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 Ultimate Fighter? Yes. UFC? Yes. Yeah, GSP is badass. Anyways, I remembered years ago, I watched George St. Pierre and Matt Hughes for a title fight and they were showing the prelims like how do these two gladiators train for such a thing and i remember i think it was matt hughes or gsp was flipping this tire in the mountains and i thought and when i saw this tire i thought buddy i'm gonna be just like george st pierre oh i I get all, I'm all stoked, you know, I'm going to be the boss. And I'm going to flip this tire all over these freaking mountains. And I'm going to come back to society one day. And I'm going to show all those people who shut the door on my face, who stabbed me in the back, who kicked me when I was down. I'm going to show them who's the motherfucking boss. <clears throat> I get all the dirt up out this damn tire. I'm all jacked. I'm stalked. Uh, and I get, I want to pick it up. Boy, and I get it right about here. And I flip it over. And I was like, oh, that's a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh, buddy. I ain't no George St. Pierre, buddy. I, I, I'm no UFC fighter. Who the fuck do I think I am? Man, I ain't got what it takes. I'm just a drug addict. I'm homeless. I got no not. And I talked myself right out of it. Caught me a fish. I came right back here. And I'm actually sitting right here at my fire pit. And I'm thinking, out of everything I've been through in this life, even the tire just beat me. Oh, no. I'm going back to get me some of that. Oh, good for you. I got all stoked and I went all the way back and I flipped it two more times and I gave up again. Then I dragged my sorry ass with my tail between my legs all the way back home, talked myself out of it. You don't know, Terrence, who the hell do you think you are? And the next day, I know who I am and I'm going to get this done. And I went all the way back, and I tried again, and I failed. And I same boo all the way home. Next day, I got to try again. And every single day, I went back and forth, back and forth. After about a week and a half, I got tired of giving up. I was so stoked to try. And I was so depressed on my way home that I didn't want the depression on the way home. So I just sat and I took a nice deep breath and I could actually start to see the green and the trees. I could see again. I could feel the wind on my skin. I could feel again. It wasn't so numb. And I just said to myself, wow, <laughs> you're still alive, bro. And that gave me enough energy to get back up and flip the tire again. And I would do this every day. And I would start to tap into what I was actually grateful for. 
there was a lot of negativity from certain people and things on my path that I, I sat and just said their name and I said, I forgive you. And I bit my tongue and I just, I forgive you. I did this for just over a month and I found myself, I was out there for 18 hours a day flipping that tire for almost a kilometer a day. Moving the energy. Moving the energy. Staying present. This was my meditation. Being grounded in the moment. Expressing gratitude, positive energy. You can start to hear the birds sing and you're kind of like, that's, that's beautiful. You can actually start feeling that positivity and the intentions to just get your life back. So after, you know, I'm out almost a month, I'm like, why is it that no doctor, psychologist, sort of all these people out there in authority didn't suggest nature? Didn't say, hey, bro, if you want your life back, you're going to have to get your ass to work. Dig in deep, and it's going to take many, many years before you can stand up straight. And when you do stand up straight, you will continue that same process every day single day still to this day i'm flipping tires still to this day so at that point that's 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 when we realized that since nobody had suggested this to me i wanted this i have two extra rooms in my cabin and i wanted to just open those those two beds for two other people so they could wake up in that bed the same way i did and let's go get to work if you're hungry, ah, guess what, buddy? Ain't no flipping, no filet mignons here. We're going fishing. Fish. And if you don't catch, you're not eating. Because that's the only way we're going to get out of our, sh our, 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 our coffin, our grave. We dug it, you're going to have to climb your own ass out. At the end of the day, and I, and, I, and I know that sounds and might sound to some people who are listening, oh, that's a little bit. Listen, we've become jellyfish, and I'm not going to sit here and try to ice, put icing on it. At the end of the day, you want to back. You've got to put in that work. Mm -hmm. and, and once we do and are able to get our lives back, what we've learned about ourselves in the process, building the confidence, what we're actually grateful for, the taste of just fresh water and a good night's rest, the ability to just dream and think, and connect to a different level of consciousness. Now things start making sense. And now that revenge, that anger, that hatred, that sadness, those blame of all, turn into self and say, hey, I got to be accountable for three quarters of that stuff. I was there. And what can I do about it? Now what we end up doing, as you'll notice, I'm sure of all the amazing, beautiful people that you speak with here, you know, they all have the same story. They're all just giving back. And that's where half of the healing comes from is helping somebody else. Yeah. And you're helping so many people. Um, how okay, so tell me about um, this fundraising that you just started. Well, we, we these last five years, so we started camp my way back in 2015. It took uh, you know, when I had this idea, I want to help other people. Well, that takes a lot of money. Mm -hmm. How do you get them up here? Safety, insurance, life jackets, canoes, food, when you have pocket lint and a big tire. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I took almost six and a half months of sleeping in the bathroom stalls in, uh, in Whistler, sleeping in the back of my truck, talking to every single person and shaking their hands and looking them in their eyes and letting them know what we intend to do and going to the reuse it center and getting old shitty old backpacks and going to the food bank i ate at the food bank for probably a good nine ten months actually i shouldn't even say that it was almost three years but like religiously at the food bank every wednesday and um letting them know about our dreams and uh, you know, like, Oh, Hey Terrence, uh, here's an extra box for when you get that camp started. And, uh, 
within that seven months, we had gained almost 30 corporate sponsors who were able to give us um, not brand new anything, but just, like I said, a couple boxes of craft dinner, some old backpacks without having to pay for them. Um, you know, people were volunteering to facilitate and do yoga instructors. And uh, my neighbors were like, oh, you know, I see out here screaming and yelling at the mountains with the tire. What do you need? I need to borrow your canoe. Here you go. You can have it, bro. <laughs> you know, and, and it took a lot of time. We ran that first camp in uh, late 2015. We had 16 people actually come up to that first oh. camp. It was quite amazing. How yep. long was? How long did they stay? Just se uh, seven days. And and what were some of the results? Well, I mean, I still am good friends with almost every single one of them. You know, two of them, two of them. You know, pe we go our different ways. We have our journeys, and and really, that was a trial. You know, I had a lot to learn that you can't use old shitty hand-me-down tents. Because when it rains, well, somebody gave that tent away <laughs> to begin with because it leaks. So, you know, we're, and we're still learning, you know, and I love it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, at that point, Bella, after we ran that camp, I realized, wait a minute now. Not a lot of people know what PTSD is. So we wanted to raise awareness. So on February the 12th, 2016, we decided to start a program, an awareness program called Breaking the Chains BC. And we flipped my good friend Fabian and I and my bulldog meathead. We flipped the 400 pound tractor tire, uh, 37 kilometers in 30 days across seven mountains while shackled in 60 pounds of steel chains to raise awareness to post traumatic stress. And we did it in memory of the luge athlete who was killed on the opening day of the gate. Amazing. I yes. saw some footage of that really amazing yeah um so you had asked a question so so first about of all the, first the, of all your 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 bulldog sitting by you always of course, <laughs> of course. yeah he, he 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 passed away two years ago but um you know he he's he's right here always like yeah. all day long you know that there's his tire actually right there and i throw it for him every morning Amazing. You know, he's, uh, yeah, so. Ah, okay. Um, I, I read that you are flipping tires uh, now. And, yep. for, and uh, you're, you're hoping to uh, fundraise some money. We actually started to flip. This, is our, this year will be our fifth annual. Okay. And we started our game plan. This best game plan. Because my, my old. Our back's getting sore, Bella. I'm telling you, all these years, what are you know, you talking I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so I figured we need help. Mm -hmm. So back in September, we decided to talk to. We have the uh, RCMP, the Vancouver Police, the Surrey Fire Rescue. We have BC Search and Rescue, the International Police Association, and the BC Paramedics and a organization called team which is uh, basically uh, an er room in a helicopter all coming to help us flip this tire and this was supposed to happen on may the may, june the 5th and we had taken seven months eight months to organize it all not only that to help us get that tire over 30 days to the top of brandywine glacier we actually i was able to reach out to the Czech Republic Special Forces Riot Unit, uh, 24 departments in Germany, three departments in Australia, and uh, two states in America, their first responders, were also going to flip tires to raise awareness for post-traumatic stress. Simultaneously, uh, did I say that right? Uh, yes, so, good enough. Close enough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah don't even ask me to spell it, because that's not going to happen. <laughs> but... Uh, we, um, yeah, and then all of a sudden COVID hit mm -hmm. and everybody's, so we pulled back and said, okay, what do you do? Well, universe says you can't go this way. 
then go that way and do your best. And that's what we did. So my partner and I, Jillian A. Brown, we ended up uh, taking our tire. We flipped it up here, Goat Mountain, and then we took it over to Mission Mountain. Um, back, we started on May the 3rd. And, you know, this wasn't just to raise awareness. This is a tool that I have to use every day and every year. Every time I touch that tire, I remember the first time I flipped it and failed. And I don't want to be there again. I know what it's like to need firewood. So I go get firewood daily. I know what it's like to have to be out homeless. So we set up tents up in the mountains, whether it's minus two degrees or not. It's get out there and get yourself, make yourself as uncomfortable as possible every day. So when tomorrow's COVID, pandemic, whatever might happen, buddy, it's just another day at the office. You'll get through this. Terrence, you're a survivor. I am not a survivor. I'm an animal with the instinctual power to heal. Ooh. Ooh. I read that in my first book I ever read called Waking the Tiger by Peter Levine. And if anybody out there would like a little more information, knowledge, wisdom from somebody of a much bigger letters behind their name than Terrence, uh, read Waking the Tiger by Peter Levine. Okay, so explain yeah. what that means to you then. What's that? Uh, your definition of survivor. Well, you share with me what your definition of survivor is. I wouldn't, a survivor, maybe if you fell off a boat without a life jacket and somebody came and got you, you survived. I'm, I think a survivor to me means making it despite everything that says this is an absolute impossibility. Which means every human being on this earth is equally a survivor. We're all capable. But we tell ourselves that we're not. We tell ourselves we need money. Oh, we tell ourselves I can't but. Well, you, you lost at the I can't but part. What are you willing to put into your recovery? Are you really on your hands and knees or are you on your face and ready to put in that work? Mm. We, we're, all, we're all capable. Absolutely. Absolutely. You go back to you know, a century or two ago. Is this the picture? People were making it. Is this the picture you had in your head when you looked out at that pigeon? When I looked out at the pigeon, when I, I, what I had in my head was actually hanging from a Coast Guard helicopter saving a patient's life. That's all I really saw was I felt the wind from the rotors coming down on me and the look on my patient's face as if I mattered. I was helping somebody that kind of like you are somebody. Wow. And look at all the people you are helping today and all the, all the people you are helping find a new way. Della, you are on our team for just inviting me here to be on uh, yours and Mr. Moore's podcast. It allows us an opportunity. And I am just one guy. Let me tell you something. We have a, an amazing team. We have an amazing board of directors, a lot of friends around the world who also believe in what we need to do to truly just give more value to the future of humanity. Uh, I stand side by side with many people. Amazing. So tell me, tell, tell the audience, whoever is hearing this podcast right now, Terrence, okay. what do you want them to know? Well, first I'd like them to know that we should send a big thank you to Nazir at Surrey Honda <laughs> and all of our brothers and sisters over at the Surrey Firefighters Charitable Society. Because when we set out on this mission, when I, I backed the story up 
to where we've made zero dollars. See, over the last five years, we've never raised money. We've never done fundraisers. We had a little GoFundMe going like two years ago. To me, for people to heal and, and enjoy the tent that they're in or the canoe that they're paddling, um, it's, it's nice when we, we didn't just go buy that. It's when the camper is here and they're in a canoe, they know that that was donated by the community. So it makes it that much more special. So we stayed away from trying to raise funds. Um, but as I learned really the hard way, I'm a, that's how I actually have to do it uh, all these years later that uh, as a business in order to help facilitate, help more people, uh, we do need to raise dollars. And uh, this year was going to be our first big fundraiser. Surrey Honda actually donated a brand new Honda CRV 2020 to the Surrey Firefighters Charitable Society, which we raffled off to raise $100,000 towards mental health initiatives. And Camp My Way was going to receive 50% of that. And I was, I was beside myself because, uh, you know, I tell you, each, each day we wake up, it's, it's, uh, it's tough to just keep the lights on. It's, uh, it's, it's you know, tough to just keep that sticker on your insurance and uh, a little bit of gas. And your my neighbor's used to me siphoning his motorhome. <laughs> He's just, he knows I'll replace it. So, so gas isn't a problem. But finally, when this um, opportunity came, I was beside myself because of the amount of people that we really can't help now. And then COVID hit. And I thought, okay, what are we going to do? Well, thanks to the community, thanks to our, our province, thanks to all the people in our country who actually were like, we love Camp My Way. We love what you guys are doing. They all bought raffle tickets, and we were able to sell, um, raise $100,000. I shouldn't say we, they. And just on Friday, uh, Aaron Sear, the head uh, He's a firefighter with Surrey Fire and Rescue. He's also an executive on the mental health uh, at the mental health board, and uh, he actually drove all the way up here to help us flip our tire uh, to the seven thousand one hundred thirty-one foot summit and handed me a check, uh, handed Camp My Way a check for forty-five thousand dollars. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's. I'm gonna pin it up on the wall. <laughs> I'm afraid to drive to the bank with it. I don't want to lose it. <laughs> nowadays, <laughs> it. nowadays, you can just snap a picture. <laughs> yeah, for <laughs> sure. For sure. Uh, so, amazing. So, yeah. So, so when you say, what do we want the people to know? Hey, you know what? There, there are a lot of good people out there that are willing to help you support your dreams, your goals. Don't let anybody tell you any different. And if you would like somebody to uh, talk with, I'm open. You send me a, a, an email. Um, I know I don't, I don't, I can't say I know how you feel or will, but, but I understand. And, um, but before you, the people do that, I have one ask. Because in the last couple of years, I said, oh yeah, call me, I'll, I'll answer the call. And I end up spending many, many hours every day. Uh, so now I have to try to minimize that time. So what I suggest to people before you call, if you're depressed or you're anxious or you're angry or you're sad, before you email me for a call, you have to do one thing. Drive to the grocery store and buy an orange. And when you're at the cashier, ask her for a marker and draw a smiley face on that orange. Walk out of grocery store and hand it to the first person you see. And walk away. Then email me and tell me how depressed, sad, or angry you are. Ah. <laughs> oh, so good. I'm going to use this. I'm telling you. It's work. You have to have courage. Do I go buy an orange? Ah, the act of selflessness. Act of kindness. Starts tickling the mind a little bit. Takes us away from our negative emotions. 
the work that it takes to get from your bed, the sheets pulled over your head, to get to your car, to get to the grocery store is hell. It's like trying to go get a damn tree off the side of the road. It's hell. But if you've made it to that grocery store, nose dripping, huh? <laughs> well, get your orange. And now you'll start getting all these fuzzies and butterflies like, oh shit, like I'm actually doing this. You know, get the market. You're looking for every excuse to get yourself out of it, which means you're not being true to yourself. The excuses you're just making up in your own mind. Stand outside. I'm telling you something right now, buddy. That handing the orange to the next person, that person who received the orange probably needed that smile more than you know. And that'll spark a good conversation. Maybe he'll have an apple pie in his cart. He'll give to you back. <laughs> you never know, but it's always that 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 that, that transaction without words or dollars. Right? That's so, so good. Yes, yes. That's, that's so good. I love I've it. I really appreciate how much uh, we've really talked. I, I, we, I. <laughs> Are you kidding? You. I, I could talk to you for another hour, but I know you're very busy, so I'm going to let you go. Terrence, you. I would appreciate the chance uh, at another conversation with you. Anytime. Okay, thank you. Thank you, you. You just send that email. Give Robert Moore a big hug for me and even give him a big wet kiss wet, right on the wet. cheek. If, and I, if I ever meet him for the first time, I will... Do that for sure. <laughs> That's for Terrence. Okay. We're okay. I know. Super. It's all over Zoom. Like, you know, be, people meet over Zoom and people do business transactions over Zoom nowadays. It's, it's really weird. It's bizarre. You know, if I could just add one more thing. If anybody's still listening, they haven't shut the computer yet. <laughs> oh, really? Um, oh, this... We have to ask ourselves, where are we going? Where's the human being going? Uh, all these Zoom calls, uh, you know, we're not having conferences, we're not having events, we're not having meetings anymore. We're dehumanizing and we're stripping away the animal instinct, we're stripping away the rational, leaving our emotions to be just like, oh. Um, consider this to the people out there. Um, Put your phone in a cupboard uh, for seven days and check in with yourself. It's just off the media, off your social media. You know, we take in. Our nervous system is perceiving everything that we see on this little... Yeah, how young are you? We are like 31. Okay. Two. Okay, so do you have... Go with that. Did, did, did they ever have... Um, do you ever remember like... Do you ever remember Romper Room? Romper, Bomper, Stomper. The, she, the lady would have like the, uh, the things. She's like, I see, I see Della. I see Terrence. Anyways. No. Okay. I don't know okay. what you're talking about. So you are only like, okay, what, 34? Sorry. Um, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, our nervous system perceives this energy out of this device as the same as being in Afghanistan getting shot. It perceives this data as the same as the five-year-old child getting the tooth pulled or having a major surgery. You know, we become what we see. We become, um, we're like a robot. Whatever we put into our phone or our Facebook accounts or our Instagram or tweeters or whatever that thing is, that's what we become, we identify as. That's just not reality. Get outside, listen to the birds sing, hug a tree, and let's do this. Let me share a tool with you that I use every single day to manage my emotions and energy when I'm not out flipping tires of mountains. Let's do okay? that. Please. Okay, let's do that please, because please. This, is, this is key. Okay. This is key. And this is work. So let me ask you. Yes. When you woke up this morning, and let's ask the people. Yeah. When we woke up this morning, what's the first thing that you do for Della? So 
okay. giving giving people a couple of seconds. Okay. I don't want okay. to be influenced by my uh, <laughs> magnific yeah. ma magnificent. Uh, <laughs> I love it. I love okay. it. All right. So when I wake up in the morning, uh, the first thing I do is when I open my eyes, I am grateful to be alive. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then? Um, and I, I just lay there for a few minutes and, um, my dog is by my side. So I get to pet him a little bit. Nice. Yes. And then I thank my mom for bringing me to Canada all those years ago. From? From Iran. Nice mom. Yes. Very nice mom. Yes. You speak uh, to her every morning. Pardon? You speak with her every morning oh, she spiritually. Lives, she she lives with me. Oh, even yeah. I thought there's a conversation between spirit. No, she lives. I, I tell her every day. I give her a kiss right here. Awesome. <laughs> that is so she carried, wonderful. She carried those big suitcases with her and her two kids, and she took us out of a crazy place. So I'm very grateful. Yeah. How long? How long ago? I guess uh, could that be so that that was um in uh, 87 I, yeah so long time i'm 48 oh, here, by yeah. the way just 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 um you know. i think your fans will uh, agree with me we're all gonna call bullshit <laughs> sure. thank you <laughs> Who doesn't want that? wow well hey good for you thank that's you. uh amazing uh thank you you Tell, tell me before I share with this because people are probably sick of hearing my voice by now. But, well, how do you keep such, you know, <laughs> you're looking young, healthy, that smile is endless. So, thank you. What are your okay. tools? Um, I, got, I got to say to you that, um, you know, my, my self discovery started three years ago. So, I, yeah. I was not always uh, a, a happy person soul really inside i was wearing a mask for many years just like you said um because of whatever happened in my past but three years ago i had an awakening and that was when yeah so my body got sick and uh, i couldn't figure out why so uh i asked i asked god for the first time in my life i said what is what is it you want me to learn here what is the meaning of this and i got shocked it was like something told me i'm you know enough wasting time you know you need to start living your best life and so uh, i did i started getting help i asked for help and i got help and um i started learning about myself i went i went deep inside i no longer wanted to blame the world my brother for my misery my dad for my misery I started selfing, t taking um, responsibility for, for, the part, for the part I played in my life. And so life just changed and all these wonderful people came into my way and I, I found joy. I found gratitude um, as a tool and, um, you know, meditation and um, a service, volunteerism and um, all these amazing things that that consequently brought joy into my life and here i am I, I i wish i could just have a two sentence paragraph like that that's like <laughs> you know hey. i just i just blew out an hour and 31 minutes Listen. and here you know it was like very well done Terrence, nice. if you ever have a podcast and you want to interview me, I'll take just as long. But this is, <laughs> that's just the gist of it. <laughs> well, very, very, well, but you, you, you nailed it. You nailed it on the head, you know, of, you know, the gratitude as a tool, the service, you know, selflessness and it's and accountability, responsibility, and taking that on, and reaching out to God and, uh, you know, to me, God stands for the great outdoors. So I'm a firm believer in God, you know, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. So, uh, so I tell you what, why don't we, um, 
have another podcast and we'll share that tool only because my battery is about to die. I think that's a great on. idea because that would yeah, give me yeah. an excuse to have you back. That would be awesome. And, and it, would be a, it would be an honor. It would really be an honor. Thank, Thank you. you. And I want to I, I um, just give you one more minute, whatever you want to say to finish this off and uh, then I'll let you go. Oh, uh, take that time for yourself uh, to forgive yourself, get to know yourself so you can be yourself and love yourself. Uh, sit, just and breathe. To, to, just simple. I, I wish I had a better uh, finale, but you know, it right. really comes down to that. You're awesome. You're amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. <laughs> Thank for everything you do. Thank you for bringing hope into other people's lives. Right. Thanks, and Thank so, you. till we meet again, my dear friend. Have, yes, absolutely. Have, have, a, have a wonderful life in British Columbia. And if you're ever in Ontario, visit. Uh, you can count on that. Thank you for your time, your support, your kind words, your beautiful smile, and for everybody out there who's uh, taking the time to listen. Reach out. It's not weak to speak, buddy. That's it. You heard the man. And if you've tuned in to watch the, this podcast, I want to thank you for your time. And please take what you want and leave the rest. And this has been another Magnetic Entrepreneur podcast. And my name is Della. Take care. Bye, Terrence. Bye for now, Della. You Bye. are the boss, buddy. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> we'll talk again soon, okay? Okay. Bye. Keep on smiling. Okay. Thanks.